Forecasting your sales, forecasting your revenue is some of the most important but unsexy activities that we engage in in our sales operations. And it can create a lot of tension between these two groups of leaders and reps. Today, what I wanna do is I wanna kinda demystify the process for you. I wanna make forecasting for you a heck of a lot easier if you're a rep and a whole lot easier to understand and report on if you were on the leadership side. Welcome back to another episode of Sales Lab Live. My name is David Premer, and you know I'm I'm gonna I'm hopefully gonna bring sexy back here to forecasting because you know forecasting is one of these things that as a sales manager, you know, and, and sales reps, we kind of roll our eyes a little bit and we say, okay, we gotta like we got it's forecasting time again, and you know the reps are going out there saying, okay, like what's the story I'm gonna tell to my manager about how my pipeline's doing this month, and the managers are just trying to figure out, you know, like hey, like what's going on, you know, what am I gonna report up to the executive team. So it's this administrative process that is kind of fraught with all sorts of like emotional issues and operational issues. And today what I wanna do is I wanna kind of demystify some of these things for you. Now, the, the way I'm gonna start this off, I'll start off with just like a quick, I'll say like a quick PSA. And this is a PSA, let's say on behalf of sales leaders, two reps, just so everyone can understand like why is sales forecasting so important? You know, as a sales rep, you're thinking, oh yeah, this is like a just, you know, maybe it's another thing that my leadership team is doing to me, you know, to kind of help keep tabs on, you know, whether I'm doing a good job or not. But the reality is, you know, especially as a, as a sales leader and as a, a, a company leader, being able to accurately predict revenue is really, really important because companies make decisions based on these revenue predictions. So for example, if our revenue is looking really good, then you know that might mean, hey, look, we can invest in more hiring, we can in invest in more marketing resources, more spiffs and promotions, uh, all sorts of things, right? And if revenue is not looking so good, well, that might mean we need to kind of pull back in some of these areas. So regardless, if you're a rep and you're thinking, well, you know, this is like another thing that you know the company's trying to do to me, keep in mind that like sale, sales and revenue forecasting is super important at the company level because they make decisions that ultimately impact not just you, but everyone else. So that's kind of like my, my PSA number one. PSA number two, and you know, this is kind of maybe a lesson learned from parenting a little bit, is that, you know, imagine as a sales manager or as a parent, you know, I come down and like the kitchen's all messy. And hey, you know, this is a fictitious story, by the way, in case my kids are watching. The kitchen kitchen's all messy and I'm like, who left this bowl here? Like who who left, you know, who left all these dirty dishes in the sink? And no one wants to own up to that, right? Because they think there's going to be some kind of punitive outcome. As soon as they 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 tell me, I'm like, oh, you're in trouble, right? So what do I do? I say, hey, look, I you know I don't I don't care who left them here. I just need some help, you know, cleaning them up. You know, I'm I'm not trying to you know put the screws to you. And and I would say the same thing goes if you're a sales leader out there or you're a sales rep. I want you to kind of pay attention to this. One of the most important things you can tell your reps as it relates to sales forecasting is that there's no emotion in sales forecasting, right? Like take the emotion out of sales forecasting. As the leader, I always said, look, whether the number is good, whether the number is bad, I just want the truth, right? <laughs> I just want to know what happened, right? Because if you're telling me like a whole bunch of like lies about your forecast, well, I, I can't build my business on lies, right? I'd, I'd rather build my business on painful truths. If I know, if I'm gonna miss my number, I would like to know that in advance. There's actually a ton of benefit for me to know that I'm gonna miss my number. So I say, don't be afraid, you know, don't be afraid of being truthful. Don't be afraid of the numbers. At the end of the day, the numbers will set you free. And certainly as, as a leader, I will say on behalf of all the sales leaders out there, we just want to know what the number is, right? Whether the number is good or bad, we want to know. It doesn't behoove us to go to our leadership and executive teams and say, oh yeah, we're going to hit this number and ultimately we do not. And now like it looks bad on us. It looks bad on our teams. No good can come from that. So what I want to do is I want to get into this content today. Now actually I'm going to, I'm going to iPad it up today because I, I do want to draw a couple things. This is going to be all about, of course, nailing your sales forecast. And I actually wrote a little article about this a little while back. I call it the top three properties of a killer sales forecast. I'm going to go through them today, but you can see here the link on the screen. So by all means, feel free to check that out. And what I want to do is I want to talk about like, well, what are these three properties? What are these three properties of a killer sales forecast? So the first thing I think about when I think about nailing your sales forecast and I tell my reps is I say like, I want this sales forecast to be accurate. And what do I mean by that? You know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, like a weather forecast. I know, I know I told this joke before about how I actually was a certified meteorologist 
and let the jokes about forecast accuracy fly. It's not a joke. It's actually true. I am a certified meteorologist. But when you go out and you know, you're know you trying to spend your day, you want the weather forecast to be accurate. You want to know when it's going to rain, when it's going to stop, how much rain, how much wind, when's the temperature, because you plan your day based on that. And the same thing is no different when it comes to a sales forecast. And you know the, the four main, you can call them fields, that uh, were really important to us back at Salesforce. And certainly, uh, I, I think about them the same way, uh, uh, thought about them the same way post Salesforce. The big four fields, as we call them, like the big four fields that needed to be accurate as it related to your sales forecast was, let's call them revenue, right? So I wanna know like how big is this deal? I wanna know the close date as best as you can, you know, forecasting it. So revenue, uh, close date. I wanna know the next steps. Sorry, can't write there. So I know revenue, close date, next steps. And shoot, now like I'm 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 totally whiffing on what the <laughs> fourth one was. I had it in my head a second ago. But but let's just yeah, I'll, I'll come back to it. Revenue, close date, uh, next steps, really, really important uh, to nail in your uh, accuracy conversation, right? Because like, if you know those things, then it gives you a much better sense of, you know, when this thing is going to be coming in, right? So accurate was the number one property of a killer sales forecast. Number two, I talk about this idea of being compre, you know where I'm going with this, comprehensive, right? So this idea that when I'm trying to forecast my revenue, I want to know what like all of the possible revenue that we could see within the month, within the quarter, could potentially be, right? So it doesn't behoove you as a sales rep to kind of stash deals out into a future, you know, into a future month or into a future quarter. Because like, if you come to me and you say, you know, hey, David, you know, here are the deals I think we can close this quarter. The thing I'm going to ask you is I'm going to say like, hey, are there any other deals that maybe we got sitting out in a future quarter that you think that we might be able to kind of, you know, pull in here? Because I want eyes on everything, right? I want eyes on everything. I want to know if there's something that we can do to bring something in, you know, kind of, you know, uh, like a Hail Mary or like a special offer or something later in the month. I want to know what those are. So very, very important that your that your uh, sales forecast be comprehensive. And by the way, uh, just to kind of come back to this, uh, uh, this conversation of, uh, uh, oh, let me just come back here, conversation of accuracy. The, the other uh, the other uh, fourth dimension is stage. I need to know what, what stage the deal is in, right? Because if you're telling me, for example, that a deal is going to come in and uh, it's going to come in this month, but it's like stage two in the pipeline, then I'm going to say, hold on a second, I, I don't know if I believe you. So if you're telling me something's going to close, I should have a really good sense of what that stage in the pipeline is. So those are the big four in terms of accuracy. And by the way, you know, we can get more into this, which we will not have time in this session, but it's always a good idea to show your reps like what good looks like as it relates to a good forecast. So like, for example, when it comes to like next steps, right? Sometimes the next steps could be something silly, like send proposal, right? Well, that doesn't mean anything. So we need to train our teams. And if you're a rep, I would say like, get good at being very, you know, I'd say comprehensive in what your next steps are. So when someone else reads them, they're able to evaluate what's going on in the deal, if it's something that they can help with. Um, but if you're a leader, certainly uh, help your team understand what good versions of these things sound like. And the nice thing is, like if you think about it, if I have a really good, accurate sales forecast, and I'm really kind of drawing in on these big four, and you're telling me that there's a particular deal that's going to close this month, but like, let's say, uh, you know, like the stage is off, right? Or the next steps is like send pricing. And you're thinking to yourself, hold on a second, how, how is this deal going to close this month? if we're just in sending pricing, it's actually really helpful as a leader, but it's also very helpful to you as a rep to be able to kind of reconcile these things in your mind and say, hey, you know what? Maybe this isn't gonna close if the next step isn't as, as tight as I'd like it to be. So comprehensive, also very important. I wanna see the deals that are kind of, you know, what's within the realm of the possible, okay? Again, we're forecasting. Forecasting doesn't mean that, for example, if I say it's gonna to rain today, right? There could be a 10% chance of rain. There could be a 100% chance of rain. Pulling in a comprehensive forecast is basically to say, hey, look, it could rain today. And if it could rain today, then I need to tell you that that is a possibility, right? So that's what I mean by comprehensive. I want to know 
all the potential deals out there, even potentially, regardless of their likelihood to close. I want to have eyes on this thing because maybe there's something that we can do to, uh, to bring some of these things in. And the third tenant here of a accurate or the uh, of a really good sales forecast is this idea of defend a bull or defendability right so this idea that you know let's say for example your vp of sales you're trying to forecast and your vp of sales calls you into their office and uh and they say you know david uh, tell me about why why do you have this deal on the forecast right the idea is that you should be able to defend, like imagine the CEO of your company called you in and said, you know, hey David, what's going on with this deal? Why is it coming in? You should be able to defend with logic and reason and evidence why that thing is gonna happen. Because again, oftentimes when we forecast, sometimes we just kind of put on our happy ears and we're like, oh, like this deal has a good chance of closing. And meanwhile, it does not. And there's actually no way you can defend why it's closing. And again, this kind of comes back into the realm of, of, uh, of wanting to know what the answer is, even if the answer is bad, right? So those are my kind of the three properties of a killer sales forecast, making sure that you can nail those things. And again, those are good if you're a sales leader, certainly working with your team to make those forecasts really good. But also if you're a rep, just making sure that you kind of have those elements shored up. Now, I will say that you can put a structure and process around those elements to make it easier for both you and your team to interpret the forecast and interpret the deals that are coming in. And we used a, a good system that I really liked at Salesforce. I know it's not for everyone um, and it would not be for every organization depending on the size and scope and, and uh, cadence of your deals. But I wanna kind of show you when we used to forecast um, the five numbers that we would forecast. And this again goes back to some of the things we talked about earlier being comprehensive and accurate and so on. So the first number we would obviously forecast as people are familiar with is the commit. Like what is the commit number? That's the C. Like basically like this is the, the number that we are committing to in blood that like this is the bottom end of, of the revenue that we believe we're gonna bring in this month. At the very least, we are committing this. Now I'll go through a little bit more of a process here in a second to kind of show you how this all comes together. But that's the idea behind the commit. The second number, that we talk about is we talk about like the most likely the ml and the most likely is kind of what it sounds like this is like eh, that's where you think you're going to end up right at the end of the day and the bc refers to like the best case so this is you know hey look if we run the board and we do everything right this is where we can end up and by the way no one's holding you by the way to this uh, best case but the idea is that when you think about like let's say your commit and your best case, these are what we might refer to as like the goalposts, right? You will not do any worse than your commit and you will not do any better than your best case. And the goal as you go throughout the month is or out the forecasting periods, so let's say you forecast every week or you forecast every month of the quarter or whatever it is, every forecast period you wanna be narrowing those goalposts, right? To give, to give your leadership team a more accurate picture of how you're doing and where you're going. The open, so the O uh, refers to open. So this is referring to like open pipeline. And the close refers to it, sorry, the C refers to as closed pipeline. And so this kind of gives you a little bit of like a status update as to like where you are right now. Okay, like we have, let's, so let's, let's give you like a, a practical example of kind of how we kind of put this all together. So if you had, let's say, a spreadsheet, and this is what we did, in fact, do, you know, my last two companies have a spreadsheet where we talk about the, uh, the different uh, uh, metrics across your forecast period. So let's say that you're forecasting for January, right? Now, oftentimes we would start forecasting for January long before January actually hit. But what we would do is we would basically go out and we'd say, okay, great. Um, on January 1st, we're forecasting for January. And, you know, we would say, okay, like I'm committing at least 100K, um, my most likely is probably like, let's say 125K. My best case, my gosh, if I run the board, maybe like 150K. Now, what would happen is we'd say, okay, like those are, that's my high level estimate of what I'm gonna do. Uh, and the good news is I've actually already closed 75K of business in January on the first of the month. And I have another, let's say 75K of open pipe. So this, you can see here, starts to tell you a little bit of a story about how this forecast is happening. So it's basically saying, hey, look, you know, I, I, I've closed 75K. I think I'm at least 100% confident I'm going to close another 25. 
Um, I feel really good about closing an, an extra 50, which would bring me to that 125 number. Best case would might be the combination of what I've closed and what I've opened, but the best case could might even be bigger than that, right? Like the open pipeline refers to the open pipeline in this particular period. There could be revenue out in other periods that I wanna bring in. I don't wanna get into all the science and all of like the minutia of this. I will tell you that this is, forecasting is a skill that you can get really good at and learn over time and learn the right questions to ask. And what was really interesting is that like as you go through the month and as you kind of start plunking in these numbers, what it does is it gives you a really good sense of like how these numbers are trending, whether the rep, whether you, if you are the rep, do, are doing a good job of individually forecasting uh, your revenue, if you have a really good handle on your business, if, you're, if your pipeline is accurate, if you're doing a good job of bringing these deals to fruition when you said they were, and the idea is that from a, a, a goalpost perspective, the commit, right, and the best case should start to converge on the most likely, right? So you start out with these wider goalposts. As the month goes on, you might say, hey, you know what, like on the last week of the month, uh, my commit is now, um, you know, 120, and my best case is like 142, uh, and my ML is like, you know, 120, 127, I'm just saying there. You see, like these are much tighter. So this, again, you know, maybe on a future episode, we can spend a lot more time going into kind of how we actually operationalize this stuff. But you see, by talking about things like the commit, the most likely, the best case, the open and close, taking a very kind of rigorous and data-driven approach to this, it actually kind of takes a lot of the emotion out of the process and helps reps better focus on the metrics, the accuracy, like those big four and whatever those big four or the big three or the big five, whatever they are if for your business, helps you focus on those and get a much better perspective on your on your pipeline, on your revenue, on the steps you need to bring those deals to fruition, and of course, any help that you need from your leadership team along the way. So I wanna kinda of leave you with this, again, this thought, forecasting, super important, not very sexy, but very important, but very critical to the functioning of your business. It is a skill that you need to be able to get good at, and by getting good at forecasting, you'll see you'll actually get better at sales in general, because you're going to be able to kind of take off your happy years. You're going to be able to have more perspective on your deals, and you're going to be able to see opportunities for you to drive deals forward or push them out or kind of move them around based on kind of your enhanced level of intuition around these factors. So that's all I got for you today. Forecasting. I hope you enjoyed this session, and we'll see you next time in the sales lab.